see what one sculpture is going to say about another sculpture slash artist, uh, please welcome Rebecca Wood. Hi everyone, um, if you know me, you know that I really try to hide and avoid uh, talking at all, so it is um, a rare treat for you guys that I'm actually under light and talking at you. Um, I am really excited though because I get to talk about my dear friend Kate and her work, who, um, which I love. and. Um, I, I know that a lot of the work that we'll look at tonight is sculptural, but I thought I would start with some of Kate's paintings. Um, so we'll jump in because we have a lot to get to tonight. Um, these are works that I saw in Kate's studio a month ago or so, um, but Kate started as a painter in her artistic practice. So um, she had done her BFA, um, or her BA in art history in 2008, but um, as an artist, she was doing a lot of realistic paintings. Um, so these were ones that she showed me a month ago, but they've been in flux since the summer. These are a series of um, what she's calling seaweed paintings. They are all made on like rigid sheets of insulation foam, and as far as I can tell, they all have two sides. Um, I thought it would be nice to include an action shot of her, her here, flipping them around for me to see the other side. Um, the thing that is interesting about this series, as well as the rest of the way that Kate approaches her work, is that the relationships in between um, multiples or individual objects are always in flux and always changing. So um, even though these might have an orientation or a sequence, um, they're easy to move around and rearrange and kind of be in play with one another. So Kate is a habitual walker. Um, she goes down to the harbor, takes a daily walk down at the harbor, and um, has a lot of kind of emotional and sentimental value for water and for floating in the water and for being around the water. And so these seaweed paintings are kind of meant to um, have this relationship with a bodily feeling um, or with a nostalgia of a memory of being in water or being soothed by the water. Um, they have to do with a specific place. This is Beignet, um, who crawled on my head. <laughs> uh, he's... Um, he was kind of distracting, so I thought I would include him. Uh, <laughs> so I think that these are kind of specific to Kate in the sense that she's making them based on a specific time or a specific place or a memory, um, but they are somehow universal. So they don't have to be autobiographical. Um, they don't have to connote this exact time or memory or place. Um, so here is another side of the, that series, and I put in a detail. And these are the tools that she's using. I don't know if she know, knew that I took this photo of her, um, of her tools, but the paintbrushes are kind of all strapped to these long appendages, which makes the mark making really loose and kind of gestural. Um, and you can see if I have another scale image, that they are like really huge in comparison to Kate herself, who is about half the size of these things. Um, so the mark making is beyond the body. Um, it's really immersive. So uh, these are also seaweed paintings. They're just little sketches. Um, just little notations of that same kind of thing. And I thought they were pretty delightful. So this is all pretty recent within the past year or so. Um, and I'm going to start to go back chronologically and do some of that, but I'll jump around eventually. 
So um, this is a series that Kate is calling Mimesis. Um, she spent approximately two years working on this series and they're all uh, multiples, really cheap multiples from the dollar store or um, you know just the corner store, lots of food items in here. We have this, which I am assuming is maybe this then reassembled, or is it a different piece, Kate? Uh, it's like uh, two halves of one piece, so inside outside. Gotcha. So what I noticed with Kate's work is that oftentimes like I'll see a photo of a piece and it's finished in that image and then you know later on there will be another photo of that same object but it's been mutated somehow and that also is a finished piece and I think that kind of flux is something that's really constant in Kate's work. Uh, these, these works were pretty unaltered in terms of the materials that she's using. Um, like her, her practice is just putting them together into geometries. So uh, the colors are unchanged, um, the surfaces are unchanged. It's just about combining things and um, making them into compositions. Uh, this is cereal, I believe, so a lot of food items. And this is a Tower of Fruit Loops, which I love. And Kate, has, Kate was talking to me a little bit about um, philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. And I didn't get too deep into that because it was... Um, something that I knew I couldn't really hit the nail on the head with, if, even if I was to you know, go back and read all of his work. But the general idea that she was pulling from his work, um, especially this piece called The World as Will and Representation from 1818, was kind of this human desire to fulfill illogical or directionless um, paths, and that uh, there's kind of this action that will just be, that will just happen. And so I see that kind of, that kind of thought process in the work here. Um, Einstein, I have a quote from Einstein who paraphrased um, Arthur Schopenhauer's idea and he says man can indeed do what he wants but he cannot will what he wants so there's kind of this um self-sabotage in this in a way i think uh there's you know this action of mounding these things together these army men these um fruit loops these pieces of cereal um so doing what she wants but not willing it to happen I don't know if I'm really getting that right, Kate, if that's what you're thinking, but that's what I'm thinking when I'm looking at this. Um, so at a certain point, uh, after two years with the mimesis work, Kate started working on um, these paper sculptures. And like the impetus to move from the, the combining of those small multiples into this work was that she was kind of feeling like she needed a little bit more decision-making um, authority in the process. So um, there's only so many ways that you can combine like a round object. You can mound it or you can make it into these geometries, but there's a little bit of limitation with that. So um, she started grabbing all of these paper cutoffs from printing, um, little paper scraps, and they kind of all have the edges you can kind of see here from the printing process. So there is a little texture um, in those that is kind of undetermined. It's just based on what she found. And so she was combining them and making like these beautiful tapestries, a lot of ring, uh, looping and um, falling and draping action, which is kind of a nice precedent to the later work that we see from her, the sculptural work where drapery is kind of held rigid. So in this place, it's kind of um, more organic. It feels like it could move on the breath of a wind. Um, so she's spent about six months kind of working with these paper pieces. 
and um, arranging them, patterning them, cutting them. And the culmination of the work, which unfortunately I don't have a photo of, was um, in 2012, she made a seven story version of one of these paper pieces for Art Prize. Um, so I think after that, it probably zapped her energy and exhausted her. Um, this kind of work still involved a lot of pre-planning in the way that the mimesis work before that did. And so I think that Kate was probably craving a little bit more um, freedom, a little bit more of an intuitive way of working. So, you know, after the seven story paper piece, she kind of takes a break from that and moves into stuff that maybe most of you have seen, I would say. Um, this stuff is from 2013, 2014, I would say. And um, she was kind of itching to return to painting. So, you know, her background's in painting, but she's been doing a lot of sculptural stuff where the colors and the actual artist's hand is not physical in a way. And so um, these works that I'm showing you now are all kind of a way of combining that three-dimensional sensibility that she had been developing with um, the painting practice that she had. So a lot of these things are cement dipped works. Um, there is carpet, fabric, clothing um, that's been dipped in cement and then painted. Uh, there is this thing that Kate told me that I thought was super interesting, which is when she was working realistically in painting, she was really fascinated by the drapery in um, Renaissance painting. And so, you know, when I heard that, you know, it totally clicked for me. There was like this painterly way that this sculptural form is um, manifesting itself uh, in space. It's really dramatic. Um, there's a lot of movement, but it's held static by the material that is encasing it. And then you'll also see, I think this is maybe the same piece. Like this might have been the drapes and then this is how she altered them. But then, I don't know, is also maybe this is those drapes. So I don't know which came first. I think that's super interesting that um, nothing seems to be precious. I would assume that maybe the cement dip happened first and then the painting happened after that. But again, they kind of feel like finished pieces that are like ensconced in time by a photograph and then can have a new life after that and then also be another piece. So um, the, a lot of the ones that you'll see coming up are still that drapery that's been um, held static by the cement, but they also have this really funny gesture where a lot of them are bisected by lines, painted lines. And um, Kate was using like tape, just eyeballing tape to get these nice, precise lines down the middle or across. And um, at the time, I think Kate had maybe just moved in to the Burns building, or it was around that time, and she had been spending a lot of time looking out the window. And if you've ever been to the Burns building, you know that there are giant, giant bay windows that face the street, and so it's really great for people watching and, st and street watching. And um, so she was saying that she was getting really interested in the tracks that were left on the street, tire tracks, footsteps, all those kinds of things. And so then these lines that she's painting then kind of become horizon lines in a way. So you'll have to pardon me because I, I um, usually talk until I start coughing. So I'm gonna try to prevent that by preemptively drinking water. Um, the other thing that I especially want to kind of point out about the sequencing of the images here and coming up is that you'll see a lot of the same like individual sculptures, so like individual objects that are recurring, but in each image they're kind of repositioned or re 
rehung with another object. And so the relationships between these objects are always changing. And I think that happens in Kate's studio as well. Like things get moved from one room to another, um, from one wall or one corner. And they're constantly having a conversation with each other that is changing. And they almost become characters in a way. So, you know, the way that this, this um, fabric, this white fabric on the bottom left is kind of hanging out with this guy and then, you know, hanging out with these other guys. There's kind of like, um, like a psychological way that Kate treats these sculptures, like as if they are characters or as if they are having some conversation with objects. Um, the cement work also kind of included paintings. So um, a lot of the fabric that's dipped and then also this series of paintings where the concrete or plaster or whatever rigid material becomes like another painting material. And you'll see again, even in the paintings, like those lines recur. So those kind of again, referencing like the horizon line or some sort of topography that is man-made or um, projected onto a, a landscape. This one I really like because, again, this feels like, you know, she installed this this piece of fabric and then maybe painted this little blue swatch and that feels finished to me. It feels like, oh, that's really nice. But then, then it evolves and becomes this thing where the blue swatch that was painted underneath is suddenly like now a part of it or has been gobbled up by it. Um, the, the painting work that ha was happening on the concrete fabric um, also kind of transformed, like that rigid material also uh, enveloped the use of plexiglass. Um, I think mostly because she just had it around and it was really exciting and intriguing. So she had this leftover plexiglass and she was using a heat gun. Um, and the idea was to make a mushroom cloud. And unfortunately I don't have a detail, but there is spray adhesive on these where um, surfaces that look speckled have actually actually have sprinkles on them. So, you know, this really heavy subject matter of, you know, the impulse being to create a mushroom cloud and then kind of inserting this humor of these sprinkles or these little decorative sparkles. Um, I think that the color in Kate's work does that a lot. And a lot of times the, the materials that she uses are really kind of hilarious. And so there is this kind of really nice balance between taking the work seriously and having serious motivations, but also um, being a little bit funny and being a little bit goofy about it and having a sense of humor. Um, these are from, these were all included in a uh, show that Kate had at Big Orbit called A Billion. This was her MFA thesis show when she was at UB. So this would have been 2014, I believe, yes? Um, all that work was in a show called Iconic Monster Box Club. Yes, at, uh, Buffalo Art Arts Studio. Which was held when I first got into grad school. Gotcha. So, I have made a mistake in my notes, but I want to talk about um, the name Iconic Cluster Foxtrot. So um, I'll get to that in a minute. Actually, no, let's go back. Let's go back. So um, the Iconic Cluster Foxtrot, again, with the humor, like Iconic Cluster, I think, was a way of kind of incorporating the idea of iconoclast and iconography, um, the cluster foxtrot kind of being like a really ambiguous way of trying to insert clusterfuck in there and 
Um, Foxtrot being like this term that comes from the phonetic alphabet for military. So, you know, tango, whiskey, Foxtrot. Um, and there, that kind of evolved, the term Foxtrot kind of evolved. Um, a Charlie Foxtrot is essentially a clusterfuck in uh, military speak. So there's kind of all these layers of like both seriousness and also humor and irony um, embedded in the work that I don't think it's necessary that you need to know all of those things, but it comes through. Um, so here we have more of those plaster paintings that I skipped through before. And this is part of um, the show at Big Orbit that was a billion for her MFA show. So um, this is the part of Big Orbit that's that little carved out hallway. And I love this kind of encapsulation of what her studio looks like. So if you ever go to Kate's studio, um, I'm not sure if it has become quite as thick and as worked over in your new place as it was in the Burns building, but um, the walls are just kind of like paint splatter, dripping. Um, I think it's partially a consequence of the action that's happening there, the making, but it's also deliberate in a way. Um, so the wall here in this little enclave becomes kind of like a capsule of Kate's studio and the way that she works within it. Um, this is a wide view of a billion. And um, this piece in the middle, the arrow piece, um, I wanna show you a video that was also playing at the gallery that involved a performance with that arrow piece. So we'll do that and then I'll kind of come back to the show and then we'll kind of talk about the body and how that, that kind of interacts with the work.
Okay, so I really I enjoy that piece a lot. I think that it's pretty it's pretty lovely. This beautiful kind of regular double sided arrow that feels very perfect. Um, it's aligned with faux like astroturf, so the nice green, silky well not silky but um, shiny uh, faux grass. But then the struggle is so real. Um, you know, this beautiful day trying to take a ride on the waves and it's just really seems to be more difficult than it should be. Um, so, you know, that that piece kind of, the artifact from that performance is, is in this show at, um, at Big Orbit. And the billion comes from just like, you can see just the, accumulation of all of these little distinct objects that have been gathered and this was one of my favorite shows um that year i remember seeing that show and just being like this is this is so good um a lot of these works here that have kind of this softer palette are plaster coated or cement coated um and they have this kind of playful candy like uh palette to them and Kate was calling them cake rocks and there's something about you know the idea of food and memory and the idea of um of food terms being related to women that I think she was playing with here um this is also part of that show so those the, they all feel like to, topographies to me and that might just be my read because that's how I read my own sculpture but um, there's a lot of like aerial views or um, zoomed in views of a landscape that is somehow artificial or um, manipulated to be more man-made, which I think is, you know, like reminiscent of the, the urge to line that double-sided arrow with the astroturf or to take the, you know, the fabric that's you know, really nice and soft and meant to go next to your skin and coat it with like this kind of um, ghastly blue or ghastly green cement. So there are all these discs. And I think part of this, this show was just kind of um, a manifestation of the, the studio process, which is just to kind of keep making and keep making and nothing kind of gets thrown out or abandoned, it all either gets piled together or um, takes on a new life after, after its first life. And this is just a quick one. I really like this, this video of the stacking. And um, these, these kind of painted backdrops are part of what I see in Kate's studio and what was kind of made in that little enclave in Big Orbit where like there is some sort of sense that you're manufacturing a background but it's really haphazard and kind of um, really draws attention to itself in a way. Um, so here are more of those cake rocks and um, these straws that are encased in cement. These are little pencil erasers encased in cement. And I had to do a hall walls um, plug because we did put a lot of that work in the first part of a mid in Western New York. And just kind of like how Kate had the shelves at Big Orbit, you know, these now are also existing on shelves next to each other. And I know that Kate was kind of trying to get away from the mimesis work where she was using found objects and um, just kind of orienting them in the way that they naturally seem to go. But that stuff still recurs. I think that there's a lot of tendency to collect things and then um, use a bundle of them in a way that is texturally interesting or materially interesting or like just has a funky color so these are all from 
um, a mid-in at Hallwalls in 2015. And then those things go back to her studio. So this was when I was there like a month ago. Um, and again, I think that the way that she rearranges them and places them next to each other, they all take on these funny new relationships with one another. And um, so you have pieces from earlier work kind of speaking to newer work and they're all, they're all having like this, this weird little party. Um, this, I don't know, I just, I think this is an experiment, but I really liked it. Um, it looks like, you know, those cake rocks that maybe are cast in like bunt pans and then also I can't resist putting another cat photo in. Um, this is a close up of that studio corner that I was talking about um, at Kate's place like a month ago. So the walls are, I mean, I, it hasn't always looked like this. It looks like many different things at many different times, but um, it becomes a place to make work um, and have like a sloppy space, but it also becomes a place where the work is framed by her own backdrop. So these are just kind of things that are living in the studio right now, and um, they might be finished or they might not be, they might be disassembled and reconfigured into something else. Um, but I wanted to show this series called For Membering. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And this isn't a series that I know a lot about, but I remember when Kate showed me like one image or two images maybe two years ago. And they're all kind of these photo pieces where she's using that backdrop that she's creating. And I apologize that the image quality isn't awesome, but I pulled these from Tumblr. Um, but she's like inserting the body into these. And I just think they're so like fascinating. Um, in some of them, the body's really apparent. And then in some of them, it's like almost disappearing. Um, so I think this goes back to the idea that, like I was talking about with the seaweed paintings, that you know the stories that she crafts for herself, and I would wager a guess that most of the work that she's making has some sort of um, kind of really dense story in her mind that it's not necessary for the viewer to know anything about, but it helps her make the work. So that these stories are kind of um, relating to a memory or emotions or um, or more specifically like emotional connections or relationships with others um, but they're not they don't have to be autobiographic um, it's not important that you know where they're coming from but it kind of helps fuel interest in making the works instead of um, making them making the sculptures mo like mostly about their formal properties. They now have like this other life or this other um, layer to them. So I, I just think that these are great, Kate, and that you should make more. <laughs> um, the backdrops I think are just really fascinating to me as well. Um, There are more works that Kate has done that have kind of this um, double exposure thing in them. And I had put 100 slides together and I didn't want to like really draw it out. So I didn't include all of those, but I highly suggest that you check out one of Kate's four Tumblr pages and you can definitely find them. <laughs> she sent me um, a email with like, this is this Tumblr and this is this Tumblr. So there's a lot of work to look at. And um, I also kind of just am gonna end here, which is like, this is the studio and so is this. This is kind of the material experimentation in the studio. And um, these are all just pretty delightful. They're just kind of all sitting on surfaces, or on tables, um, like in process or not, who knows? They're just kind of sitting there. Um, and maybe like having something 
adjacent to it, something new adjacent to it, then changes the trajectory of it. But I was asking Kate about the little moments where, um, I'm trying to see if I can see one clearly here, like where a little piece will pop through. So um, like these little moments where you have a swath of color and then there's just like one punctuation. And um, Kate was talking about, you know, like how our brain fills voids in our vision for us. And so there are always these like little black spots. And I think this is actually the one that she was specifically talking about here on the right or on the left <laughs> to do the right and left. Um, so there's kind of this really beautiful formal um, way that Kate puts things together, but the things that she's thinking about and the things that are percolating um, are also really interesting, and I wouldn't have known about them unless I had asked her. So um, we end here in Kate's studio uh, with Kate talking with her hands and telling me all of my, um, answering all of my questions, and um, the pieces that are broken uh, they 90% of them end up in new work. Maybe 10% of them are precious and not to be touched. So that the flux and the play with all of the things that she makes, I think, recurs in all of these different ways from painting to um, using the objects like in photography or as, as performances. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess if you have any questions, please ask me, but I don't know that I can necessarily channel everything that's in Kate's brain, but I'll do my best to answer them. Um, it was really enjoyable looking through all of Kate's work, and um, I highly encourage you to do a studio visit with her if you are curious to see more. Anybody have any burning questions? Um, Anything that they want to shout out? Yeah. Yep. What kind of uh, pigments are being used in these different types of work? As far as I know, they're acrylic. Um, the stuff that's in plaster, I believe, is also acrylic, so mixed in with the plaster. Okay. <clears throat> this is more of an observation. Oh, sorry. You first? <coughs> you outrank me. No. <laughs> It's more of an observation and a question, but the, the, the really early ones with the fruit loops and mm -hmm. um, suckers yeah. felt like large scale sculptures. Mm -hmm. um, and I know they can't be because they're fruit loops, but I couldn't, like, not seeing them next to anything, I couldn't help seeing them as like monumental mounds. Um, and I don't know if that means anything. It, would be, it, it kind of would have been interesting to see something next to it to establish scale, but on the other hand, then I wouldn't have seen them as monumental. <laughs> no, right, points. right. And I would guarantee you that probably some of them don't exist anymore, so <laughs> the chance yeah. for that has passed for a scale. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask about, you know, the, um, the work that you're showing in the studio mm -hmm. versus showing in the gallery. Mm -hmm. and. It seems like there's such a difference when you see work in the studio than when you see it in the gallery. And I, I guess that's probably an obvious statement, but it seems like you're really showing the difference here. And even, I mean, for example, when the Albright Knox was acquiring the work of Madisol, um, they showed pictures of the work in the studio in New York City. And it looked, it all looked really at home in her studio. And it looked very different when it was being displayed in the gallery. Um, and I guess I wonder if this is something that people in the arts discuss, you know, whether if you're, if you're having exhibits of art, I mean, you have to have a place to display it. And you have to have a place with hall walls that gets funding to have exhibit space open and to talk about the art and to, you know, interpret it for people. But is, is it maybe doing a disservice to art, like, not to show it in the studio? 
I, I think that it really depends on the artist. I mean, you know, we're talking, I'm assuming that the person that you're talking about is historical, right? So the curators who organize that show are attempting to put it in context because perhaps that work has been seen um, in a pristine gallery before. Um, but as far as living artists and contemporary artists, I think that that decision is really um, comes from them, you know, comes from their own practice and what they're wanting to do. Um, with Kate, that little corridor in Big Orbit, I think, was kind of really site specific, um, pretty uh, instinctual um, because she's already kind of doing that in the studio, so she's bringing that into the gallery space intentionally, but I would assume that most living artists would much rather, like, you know, they're seeing their work in the studio every day, so um, for the purposes of documentation and the purposes of, you know, seeing things without distractions or in a new context, I would assume that most living artists are wanting to kind of edit that way. But the reason I chose to include these images in my talk was because I think that there's a, a very thin and tenuous line between the making in the studio and then the way that um, we, we are used to seeing Kate's work, um, both at Buffalo Art Studio or at Big Orbit or wherever she shows. I think that um, the, the, method, the methods that she's using are pretty tied to the studio, the way the studio looks. So I thought it would be good to include those here. Does that, a, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. helps put it in contact. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yes, Jerry. I want you to say something about your take on the role of um, experimentation and play and the materiality of, you know, as she's been working with concrete and the plaster and, um, uh, and the role of how experimentation or imperfection and what happens as a result of just working with that material and pushing and how that's connected or expressed through the work. Can you be more specific with that? Um, as you've seen the whole arc of all of the work, mm -hmm. um, how do you um, how do you describe or, or um, um, the role of uh, um, the unexpected? I guess how that how. Well, I think that that's a pretty dominant component of the work. I think that, you know, by trying different processes, by, you know, using cement and dipping and seeing what happens and then going from there to see how that evolves into dipping um, fabric and then maybe draping it over some sort of weird pole. I mean, that, that experimentation is evident, I think, in, in the work. Um, I'm not sure, like, if there was something specific that you're kind of gravitating towards, because I feel like I'm being really vague. Um, the color palette, what would you say about the color palette as it sort of changed? Okay, um, I think that that probably has a lot to do, and Kate, you can shout out and like yell me down if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of that has to do with the, um, the storytelling that Kate does for herself as an artist that is not necessarily um, important for us to know, but I think there's a narrative that goes on um, when Kate's making work, so that really drives the palette. So for example, like a really concrete example would be those cake rocks and thinking about them as something that, you know, has this edible component to that. And so what is like a sugary, sweet kind of palette? And, and that I think is a really good example of how like the narrative of the artist is kind of driving maybe surfaces or palettes, those kinds of things. Does that help? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Great. Great. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Kate, for sharing your work.